नमस्कार आई कंग्रेचुलेट द बिल्ला इंडस्ट्रियल एंड टेक्नोलॉजिकल म्यूजियम फॉर ऑर्गेनाइजिंग दिस सेशन टुडे ऑन गांधी एंड इज रेलिवेंस टू अस द टॉपिक दैट आई हैव सिलेक्टेड इज वन दैट मे इंटरेस्ट पीपल हु आर एनग्रॉस्ड इन साइंस एंड दैट क्वेश्चन इज was gandhi against science that this is that oft repeated uh, charge that gandhi was not in favor of science and uh, we can start with uh, some of the uh, mentions made on this score by very famous people aldous huxley had was one of the first ones to start this he said tolstoyans that's people who followed tolstoy of russia and uh, gandhiites tell us to return to nature in other words abandon science altogether and live like primitives now the second part is dr huxley's own edition return to nature meant for gandhi being in more in harmony with nature and imagine more than 100 years ago he was espousing the cause of peace with our environment and that was twisted to say that he had said that we should live like primitives it is a sort of lack of understanding or misunderstanding on the part of a great man like uh, alder saxley but then this gained currency the other person who was vociferous against gandhi was dr meghnat saha Dr Meghnat Shah was a genius in his own right but he had his own uh, ways of expressing himself which didn't make him very popular now uh, not only in this case but in many other cases he lost out to very big uh, assignments because of his rather uh, brusque way of speaking meghnat shah told a uh, russian delegation in the early part uh, early years of independence that we don't we scientists are not bothered about gandhi we don't accept him just like you your scientists don't accept tolstoy again the question of tolstoy coming in in the sense that he was taken to be a more humanist philosopher person philosopher sort of a person who was de- detached from science and rationality but that is not a complete picture the problem was compounded in 1956 unfortunately when pandit nehru uh, declared his new scientific policy resolution and in that episode he tried to clarify a bit of what uh, uh, what this uh, so called dispute between gandhi and nehru was in trying to clarify he actually uh, got the matter a little more complicated and it is from this point that we get this binary coming in that nehru was a rationalist and a pro science person which is perfectly correct and gandhi was a religious man that is also correct but gandhi's religiosity did not necessarily mean that he was anti science the point is gandhi as a philosopher gandhi's priorities were more to the heart more to peace more to non violence did not mean that he was against science now if that is so where did it all start well uh, the first place where we get this sort of thing is in 1909 when gandhi ji was in south africa and he wrote in his hindu swaraj machinery has begun to desolate europe machinery is a chief symbol of modern civilization it represents a great sin now that was gandhi's way of putting it the same year he wrote in indian opinion the boast about the wonderful discoveries and the marvelous inventions of science good as they undoubtedly are if is after all an empty boast they offer nothing substantial to struggling humanity 
Now, this was a bit of an extreme position that a very young man had taken at that point of time because he felt he was perfectly correct when he said that machinery is devouring our civilization. That means automation and huge machines, they are displacing uh, employment, they are uh, in a way, in a way, um, contrary to our civilizational values, <coughs> the machine age as we call it, the factory age, they brought with him, they brought with themselves a lot of social ills. So to that extent, he was correct. But his stand uh, in 1909, which is quoted again and again, is not correct because his stand in 1909 gets modified as he goes along life and he picks up more and more information about science. Uh, he was not anti-science. The question is, on the contrary, we must remember that the essence of science lies in experimentations with propositions, with postulates and continuous experimentation, continuous questioning, what we call empiricism. Without empiricism, there can be no, no uh, science, there can be no crux of rationality. And it is this that Gandhi was obsessed about, uh, by getting through, that his methods were extremely scientific. He subjected himself to all sorts of questions, all sorts of doubts, and until he had substantial evidence and substantial proof in his own journey, he never accepted a proposition and was willing to change his postulate on the, on the arrival of new evidence. This is the heart of the scientific endeavor. And to this extent, we must say that Gandhi was deeply a questioning scientist. Uh, in Gandhi's opinion, that the, the scientists have misplaced their priority. He was not against science. He said science is ignoring the needs of suffering millions in the country. Now, we must remember Gandhi's thoughts evolved. And at that point of time, as a young man in the field, he really felt that uh, the weapons of destruction, the, the armaments, the brutal uh, automation of uh, craft work that was throwing millions out of jobs, they were in fact uh, causing great harm. But he, as I said, he was looking at science in the context of suffering millions. In 1921, we must remember he had come back to India in 1915. So this is six years after when he had more or less assumed the leadership of the Congress. Uh, the Indian National Congress was then a freedom movement, not a political party. And there speaking in Delhi, his quotes are, the spirit of research that fires the modern scientists. He was complimentary. My quarrel is not against that spirit. My complaint is the direction that the spirit has taken for merely material advances. So he was being very clear that if science was being harnessed by aggressive elements and by profit-making capitalists, it would obviously go against the mass of humanity. So to that extent, he was perfectly correct. And as we move along, we shall see Gandhi's involvement with science that people don't emphasize on. In 1922, the next year, he went on to say, there has been no disturbance that has been created by machinery that cannot be corrected. He said, so science is a continuous process of self-rectification. And he said that even when it is led astray by, as I said, by people with uh, hegemonic instincts, people who would like to dominate others, people involved in warfare, people believing only in capitalist profit. So when they had harnessed science for this, for their purposes, this, this harnessing or this path of science could obviously, could always be rectified. Gandhi did not condemn the scientific temper. I told you a few minutes ago, that he was in favor of empiricism, continuous self-questioning. He did not condemn the scientific temper of the West, 
but he objected to the use of scientific discoveries against humanity. We have already said, and at different points he has been quoted, machines are merely our tools. They cannot be our masters. And that was what was happening. They cannot be our masters. Now, let us see um, another aspect of Gandhi when he says, the sewing machine, the sewing machine is one of the very, very useful things ever invented by man. Now, here was Gandhi speaking in his own, with his own heart. He wanted humans to put in a certain amount of labor, which they had to do when, uh, when they were stitching, when they were stitching or sewing. And uh, he wanted labor to be an, an integral part of human activity. And he also wanted uh, mechanization to take over that part which it does better than humans. That means the, the needle movement. So here is a typical example. Now, why was he mentioning this? And if you notice, there is a similarity with the charkha that he has found. The question is, he felt that if humans get completely delinked from the process of production and leave it only to machines, I mean, he would have been frightened of artificial intelligence and machine learning and things like that, unless someone explained to him uh, the bright side as well. But in any case, his was a question of labor and displacement. Labor not for the sake of labor only. Labor because it involved a certain amount of human activity. Now, what has happened now is since most of our activities, physical activities have disappeared, we have to make it up in the gym. We have to go out for long walks. We have to do push-ups and other things. He said, why do we bother? The natural man should put a certain amount of energy in his work. So this was his view when he praised the sewing machine. In 1917, Gandhi went to Calcutta to attend the opening of J.C. Bose's Research Institute. And you know what he said? After visiting the institute, he said, or the inauguration, he said, it was a spiritual affair rather than a public show. What he meant was, his, that was his language. Spiritual means it's a very satisfying event. And uh, it was not a tamasha, uh, as most inaugurations turn out to be. And he felt deeply with the cause that Acharya J.C. Bose, Jagadish Chandra Bose, was involved in. So basically, he was looking at the intent and the harnessing of scientific inventions and uh, knowledge for the good of humanity. Uh, Thanks to the marvelous, this is another quote I'm saying, thanks to the marvelous researches of Bose, his discoveries are revolutionizing the accepted norm. Now, here is there. So he was, when we start quoting his 1909 uh, tirade against science, but we don't, uh, we don't give much attention to the other statements. Gandhi's outlook, I repeat, was science plus machinery can be accommodated and should be accommodated, provided they do our bidding. Now, the question is, who is serving what? Who is serving what? Now, this is more interesting. In 1925, in Trivandrum, he said, it is a common superstition in India and more so, use the word superstition, remember. It's a common superstition in India and more so outside India, that I am an opponent and a foe of science. He declared that he went out in the open. Nothing can be further from truth than a charge of this character. It is perfectly true, however, that I am not an admirer of all science. I think we can, but I still say we cannot live without science, but we must keep it in its right place. Science has to coexist with humanity or human feelings. However, there is nothing wrong in it. There is nothing wrong in it. Then further, two years ahead, in 1927, at the Institute of Science, <coughs> he focused on science for the downtrodden. So you must understand his priorities. His priorities was how to get more and more 
things, more and more inventions, more and more help to assist the struggles of mankind, whether it be against disease, whether it be against whether it be against uh, war, wherever. He, he was very clear that humans come first and science, machinery and others must be used for their favor. You see, the contrary concept has been developed into so many science fictions where you get the evil scientist. The evil scientist was out to destroy the world and our hero has to go and destroy his plan. This is a common theme in all uh, many science fiction, many movies, that there's an evil man who's sitting there with his control panel about to destroy the world. In other words, even 50 years ago, even 100 years ago, there was always a possibility that science is such a powerful tool in its own right that if it goes into the wrong hands, it can do terrible devastation. That is what Gandhi was saying. And in 1927, he pleaded with the scientists of Indian Institute of Science to please, please let the big corner of your heart perpetually be warm for the benefits of our billions. So his emphasis was very clear. Now, we, we can get into something more interesting. You know, Gandhi actually held a contest with a reward and a prize of 1 lakh rupees, imagine in 1929, 1 lakh rupees for devising, for designing a charkha machine, charkha machine that would convert raw cotton into yarn, direct from raw cotton to yarn. So his priorities were let science intervene between the cotton and the yarn. Let science intervene so that this yarn can then be used to produce cloth. This long laborious process of converting uh, cotton through spindles into thread, this is laborious and this is to a large extent uh, a waste of time. But the thread, but the uh, yarn that comes out is the basic ingredient with which humans live. This machine would make Indian handloom weavers more competitive. Now you must remember during Gandhi's time, British industrial civilization, especially the cotton spinning industry, was out to finish off India. You have heard of the plight of weavers. You have heard of how he visited Lancashire when he was there to assure the workers, British workers, that I, I don't mean evil for you, but please try to understand the products of your machine are completely destroying the vocation, the age old, the, the, the economics of India. So we need to take it that way. Now, let us see the number of scientists with whom he kept correspondence. A man who hates science cannot be on such friendly terms with so many scientists. Einstein, he never met Einstein, but the two were deeply in correspondence. And there are very passionate correspondence between the two. And a man of the, the prophet of science like Einstein would not come to Gandhi, would not write to Gandhi if he did not feel that the man had his heart in the right place and the man was not against science. They appreciated each other's work. In fact, they planned to meet as well, but it sort of somehow didn't work out. And Einstein wrote to Gandhi, your work shows that the world to the world that the goal can be achieved without violence. I hope to meet you in future. So this was a uh, statement that I made <coughs> that Gandhi replied to Einstein. The world's topmost scientist was there as a, in praise of Gandhi. J.C. Bose, we have already mentioned to many uh, people in Calcutta, J.C. Bose is just the name of a road, J.C. Bose Road. Uh, Acharya JCB. JC Bose has to be understood in the context in which he became famous and his endeavors within very limited resources and the type of recognition from which he was deprived. Anyway, then we have Acharya P. C. Ray, Prafulla Chandra Ray, 
he is also apc road he is also apc road here for us but we again need to get beyond all this fixation and look at the acharya for his own worth he was a chemist and entrepreneur and as a model he put him up gandhi ji put up acharya pc ray as a model of aligning science with the progress of society in effect gandhi wanted science to take cognizance of the pressing concerns of humanity jc uh, pc ray was a uh, was a model to him was a hero to him and as you know uh, acharya pc ray went in for setting up bengal chemical and many other enterprises where local resources could be utilized for the benefit of indians c v raman was also in awe of mahatma gandhi and you visited him along with his wife so but there was a catch to this story having known so many scientists he picked up j c bose c v raman and p c ray and made them members of his khadi development board he did not let them go he said you are scientists you say that you you will you will be with me in helping humanity now come and join the khadi development board and see where technology can come into real use and that will be the real test of science i, I, I remember because i was also in this khadi development board much later and uh, anyway now let us go a little bit into his views on some aspects of science to understand that he was not taking us back to the primitive age this odd feeling that he he believes that huxley had started saying that he wants us to go back to nature and become primitive men now that's not fully correct as i kept on saying look at his attitude towards astrology and astronomy as you know astrology goes in for all sorts of predictions readings of planets not in the sky readings of planets through their yantras through their houses and many of us i mean i personally feel it is all hocus pocus i personally feel it just a waste of time i better not tell my wife because she gets um anyway so uh but astronomy is as perfect a science as we can have so both of them are dealing with planets and stars they are dealing with the universe but one takes a scientific attitude and the other does not and look at gandhi's attitude to them gandhi ji even without knowing much about astronomy he kept on saying there is an orderliness in the universe there is an unalterable law governing everything and every being that exists our lives or lives it is no blind law for no blind law can govern the conduct of living beings when he said living beings he meant everything that was alive that had life in it he was convinced and in his own way he had already arrived at these solutions of uh, that astronomy the ultimate uh, <coughs> equilibrium <coughs> and the challenges to that equilibrium that the universe represents and for astrology he just threw it out of the window if he was a primitive band he would have picked up astrology and thrown out astronomy let's look at another thing nature man nature therapy of course he believed in nature therapy and what's wrong about it naturopathy is now big big uh, sector and uh, he was one of the first ones to go ahead for naturopathy nature nature cures and others but when it came to when it came to uh, medical disciplines like ayurveda he was somehow pretty much against it he said that ayurveda has lost its glory and it can only be recovered if the vaids vaids means the physicians acquired honesty of purpose and pursued the research spirit of the west he felt that ayurveda was stagnating with some amount of information with a large amount of information 
that they had once acquired and was not growing. They were not testing their own hypothesis. They were not breaking out into new areas. And more important, if you are a science, you bring it out in the public domain for others to challenge. Ayurveda used to keep all their uh, findings or all their methods rather secretive. And they thought they could solve everything. So Gandhi's attack on Ayurveda is takes the bottom out of the argument of people like Huxley and Meghnath Saha and others that the, we require the honesty of purpose and the honesty of research, continuous research as in the West. Gandhi evoked a lot of criticism and Kaviraj Gyananath Sen, Gyananath Sen of Calcutta, of Calcutta, a very senior practitioner, challenged him to clarify his views. You have already mentioned it. Now please tell us what you feel. And to that, instead of turning back, he said, many Ayurvedic practitioners were mere quacks. They pretend to know much more than they actually did. Instead of studying the Ayurvedic system and indulging in research, they are keeping it completely hidden from the world. It's a stagnant system instead of a gloriously progressive science. So he was in favor of gloriously progressive science. That is what we need to understand. Basically, we don't need to get into this Ayurveda dispute because there are some people who still believe. But he kept on saying that Ayurveda cannot pass or at that point of time could not pass through the rigor of scientific examination. And this man is supposed to be anti-science. And then he says, I know not of a single discovery or invention of any importance on the part of Ayurvedic physicians as against a brilliant array of discoveries and inventions in which Western physicians and surgeons boast. So he was talking of the great strides that allopathy had made only because it kept on reinventing itself at every point. And Ayurveda was just treasuring some wealth that was acquired a thousand years, maybe two thousand years ago. So <coughs> he, he was very clear in his outlook. Throughout, you know, the question is, when you study his, doc, his statement of 1909, his uh, biting comments and then the position that we are talking of at the later stages. Don't we find an inconsistency? He said there is no inconsistency. Throughout my life, I have refused to admit any dogma. That is what science is all about. In his opening note in Hind Swaraj, again in a much later edition, I am not at all concerned, he said, with appearing to be consistent. In my search after truth, I have discovered many ideas, learnt many new things and discarded several opinions. Now, that is the essence. They remember that is the guiding light of our lives, that we don't hold on to a dogma just because we learnt it and we got fascinated with it at a young age or at some point of time. Again, as Gandhi says, what I'm concerned with is my readiness to obey the call of truth. My life consists of nothing else but numerous experiments with truth. If you remember his autobiography, the name of his autobiography was My Experiments with Truth. If I can narrate them in a dispassionate and humble spirit, far be it from me claiming any perfectness anywhere, either in my early age or in my later age. I claim for them nothing, these experiments more, than does a scientist, who, though he conducts his experiments with utmost accuracy, forethought and minuteness, this is what he talks about science, as a scientist who conducts his experiment with utmost accuracy, forethought and minuteness, never claims any finality of his conclusions, but keeps an open mind. It's the open mind 
that has taken us to such heights where science is concerned. I hope I have been able to clarify the much debated idea about uh, Gandhi and science. Mahatma Gandhi was not against science, he was against the misuse of science. And with these words, I take your leave. Namaskar.